Chapter 19. The Sheep Washing. The Offer. Boldwood did eventually call upon her. She was not at home. Of course not, he murmured. In contemplating Bathsheba as a woman, he had forgotten the accidents of her position as an agriculturist, that being as much of a farmer, and as extensive a farmer, as himself, her probable whereabouts was out of doors at this time of the year. This, and the other oversights Boldwood was guilty of, were natural to the mood, and still more natural to the circumstances. The great aids to idealization in love were present here, occasional observation of her from a distance, and the absence of social intercourse with her, visual familiarity, oral strangeness. The smaller human elements were kept out of sight, the pettinesses that enter so largely into all earthly living and doing were disguised by the accident of lover and loved one not being on visiting terms, and there was hardly awakened a thought in Boldwood that sorry household realities appertained to her, or that she, like all others, had moments of commonplace, when to be least plainly seen was to be most prettily remembered. Thus a mild sort of apotheosis took place in his fancy, whilst she still lived and breathed within his own horizon, a troubled creature like himself. It was the end of May when the farmer determined to be no longer repulsed by trivialities or distracted by suspense. He had by this time grown used to being in love. The passion now startled him less even when it tortured him more, and he felt himself adequate to the situation. On inquiring for her at her house they had told him she was at the sheep washing, and he went off to seek her there. The sheep washing pool was a perfectly circular basin of brickwork in the meadows, full of the clearest water. To birds on the wing its glassy surface, reflecting the light sky, must have been visible for miles around as a glistening cyclops eye in a green face. The grass about the margin at this season was a sight to remember long, in a minor sort of way. Its activity in sucking the moisture from the rich damp sod was almost a process observable by the eye. The outskirts of this level water meadow were diversified by rounded and hollow pastures. Where just now every flower that was not a buttercup was a daisy. The river slid along noiselessly as a shade, the swelling reeds and sedge forming a flexible palisade upon its moist brink. To the north of the mead were trees, the leaves of which were new, soft, and moist, not yet having stiffened and darkened under summer sun and drought, their color being yellow beside a green, green beside yellow. From the recesses of this knot of foliage the loud notes of three cuckoos were resuming through the still air. Boldwood went meditating down the slopes with his eyes on his boots, which the yellow pollen from the buttercups had bronzed in artistic gradations. A tributary of the main stream flowed through the basin of the pool by an inlet and outlet at opposite points of its diameter. Shepherd Oak, Jan Coggan, Moon, Pawgrass, Cane Ball, and several others were assembled here, all dripping wet to the very roots of their hair. And Bathsheba was standing by in a new riding habit, the most elegant she had ever worn, the reins of her horse being looped over her arm. Flagons of cider were rolling about upon the green. The meek sheep were pushed into the pool by Coggan and Matthew Moon, who stood by the lower hatch, immersed to their waists, then Gabriel, who stood on the brink, thrust them under as they swam along, with an instrument like a crutch, formed for the purpose, and also for assisting the exhausted animals when the wool became saturated and they began to sink. They were let out against the stream, and through the upper opening, all impurities flowing away below. Kenny Ball and Joseph, who performed this latter operation, were if possible wetter than the rest, they resembled dolphins under a fountain, every protuberance and angle of their clothes dribbling forth a small rill. Boldwood came close and bade her good morning, with such constraint that she could not but think he had stepped across to the washing for its own sake, hoping not to find her there, more, she fancied his brow severe and his eye slighting. Bathsheba immediately contrived to withdraw, and glided along by the river till she was a stone's throw off. She heard footsteps brushing the grass, and had a consciousness that love was encircling her like a perfume. Instead of turning or waiting, Bathsheba went further among the high sedges, but Boldwood seemed determined, and pressed on till they were completely past the bend of the river. Here, without being seen, they could hear the splashing and shouts of the washers above. Miss Everdeen, said the farmer. She trembled, turned, and said good morning. 
his tone was so utterly removed from all she had expected as a beginning. It was lowness and quiet accentuated, an emphasis of deep meanings, their form, at the same time. Being scarcely expressed. Silence has sometimes a remarkable power of showing itself as the disembodied soul of feeling wandering without its carcass, and it is then more impressive than speech. In the same way, to say a little is often to tell more than to say a great deal. Boldwood told everything in that word. As the consciousness expands on learning that what was fancied to be the rumble of wheels is the reverberation of thunder, so did Bathsheba's at her intuitive conviction. I feel, almost too much, to think, he said, with a solemn simplicity. I have come to speak to you without preface. My life is not my own since I have beheld you clearly, Miss Everdeen, I come to make you an offer of marriage. Bathsheba tried to preserve an absolutely neutral countenance, and all the motion she made was that of closing lips which had previously been a little parted. I am now forty-one years old, he went on. I may have been called a confirmed bachelor, and I was a confirmed bachelor. I had never any views of myself as a husband in my earlier days, nor have I made any calculation on the subject since I have been older. But we all change, and my change, in this matter, came with seeing you. I have felt lately, more and more, that my present way of living is bad in every respect. Beyond all things, I want you as my wife. I feel, Mr. Boldwood, that though I respect you much, I do not feel, what would justify me to, in accepting your offer, she stammered. This giving back of dignity for dignity seemed to open the sluices of feeling that Boldwood had as yet kept closed. My life is a burden without you, he exclaimed, in a low voice. I want you, I want you to let me say I love you again and again. Bathsheba answered nothing and the horse upon her arm seemed so impressed that instead of cropping the herbage she looked up. I think and hope you care enough for me to listen to what I have to tell. Bathsheba's momentary impulse at hearing this was to ask why he thought that, till she remembered that, far from being a conceited assumption on Boldwood's part, it was but the natural conclusion of serious reflection based on deceptive premises of her own offering. I wish I could say courteous flatteries to you, the farmer continued in an easier tone, and put my rugged feeling into a graceful shape, but I have neither power nor patience to learn such things. I want you for my wife, so wildly that no other feeling can abide in me, but I should not have spoken out had I not been led to hope. The Valentine again. Oh that Valentine! She said to herself, but not a word to him. If you can love me say so, Miss Everdeen. If not, don't say no. Mr. Boldwood, it is painful to have to say I am surprised, so that I don't know how to answer you with propriety and respect, but I'm only just able to speak out my feeling, I mean my meaning, that I am afraid I can't marry you, much as I respect you. You are too dignified for me to suit you, sir. But Mississippi Everdeen. I, I didn't, I know I ought never to have dreamt of sending that valentine, forgive me, sir. It was a wanton thing which no woman with any self-respect should have done. If you will only pardon my thoughtlessness, I promise never to. No, no, no. Don't say thoughtlessness. Make me think it was something more, that it was a sort of prophetic instinct, the beginning of a feeling that you would like me. You torture me to say it was done in thoughtlessness, I never thought of it in that light, and I can't endure it. Ah! I wish I knew how to win you. But that I can't do, I can only ask if I have already got you. If I have not, and it is not true that you have come unwittingly to me as I have to you, I can say no more. I have not fallen in love with you, Mr. Boldwood, certainly I must say that. She allowed a very small smile to creep for the first time over her serious face in saying this, and the white row of upper teeth, and keenly cut lips already noticed, suggested an idea of heartlessness which was immediately contradicted by the pleasant eyes. But you will just think, in kindness and condescension think, if you cannot bear with me as a husband. I fear I am too old for you, but believe me I will take more care of you than would many a man of your own age. I will protect and cherish you with all my strength, I will indeed. You shall have no cares, be worried by no household affairs, and live quite at ease, Miss Everdeen. 
the dairy superintendence shall be done by a man, I can afford it well, you shall never have so much as to look out of doors at haymaking time, or to think of weather in the harvest. I rather cling to the shares, because it is the same my poor father and mother drove, but if you don't like it I will sell it, and you shall have a pony carriage of your own. I cannot say how far above every other idea and object on earth you seem to me, nobody knows, God only knows, how much you are to me. Bathsheba's heart was young, and it swelled with sympathy for the deep-natured man who spoke so simply. Don't say it. Don't. I cannot bear you to feel so much, and me to feel nothing. And I am afraid they will notice us, Mr. Boldwood. Will you let the matter rest now? I cannot think collectedly. I did not know you were going to say this to me. Oh, I am wicked to have made you suffer so. She was frightened as well as agitated at his vehemence. Say then, that you don't absolutely refuse. Do not quite refuse. I can do nothing. I cannot answer. I may speak to you again on the subject? Yes. I may think of you. Yes, I suppose you may think of me. And hope to obtain you? No, do not hope. Let us go on. I will call upon you again tomorrow. No, please not. Give me time. Yes. I will give you any time, he said earnestly and gratefully. I am happier now. No, I beg you. Don't be happier if happiness only comes from my agreeing. Be neutral, Mr. Boldwood. I must think. I will wait, he said. And then she turned away. Boldwood dropped his gaze to the ground, and stood long like a man who did not know where he was. Realities then returned upon him like the pain of a wound received in an excitement which eclipses it, and he, too, then went on. End of chapter 19 Thank you.